the cross, Let the cross the the You're listening to the Cyclocross Podcast by the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses across the globe. Hello, this is the Cyclocross Podcast by the Cycling Podcast in association with our friends at Mud Eater. My name's Lionel Burney and I'm in the Amstel Experience Cafe in Valkenburg again, this evening joined by Renat Schotter. How are you, Renat? Oh, I'm great. It was an amazing day and a thrilling day. Uh, we shouldn't tell all from first, but uh, an unforgettable day, really. I mean, it started really shitty, but I feel great right now and we had some amazing races. And also, welcome to the podcast, Balint Hambas. I uh, hope I got that right. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Balint. Well, you arrived this morning. What were your first impressions when you got up there and you saw the state of the course? As we talked about this in the kind of preview with, uh, with Daniel, this was the first time that I saw this course really, really muddy. And so I think it was a bit of an unknown quantity. And I think it was just, it just made it really, really, from a photography point of view, it was amazing to have all this mud and it was slipping and sliding. And it's just, it was a really cool day. It certainly was. I mean, there was a lot of cross and some cyclo and there was some running upstairs and there was some slipping and some falling over. Well, in the highlight of my day has been the, the better balls that we've uh, just enjoyed. You said very tasty, but you don't really want to know what's in them. To be very honest, my, my favorite is the frikandel, which is kind of made of the same thing, but it's just a bit longer. It's like a, it's like a sausage, but it was, it was very nice. It was very nice. Renat, maybe you can tell us what is in it and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll feel a bit queasy, maybe. Uh, the way they make frikandellen is really um, very intelligent. I mean, they, um, the remainders of the carcasses of the dead animals are being um, stripped off the carcass and then they make that into one delicious meat uh, dish. So it's really, uh, really <laughs> very, very... Very uh, high cuisine. <laughs> I, I apologise to our vegetarian and vegan listeners uh, who may be tuning in, but they're, a, I, I think, a delicacy. They're very tasty, nice with a mustard dip. Anyway, on with the cyclocross. We're going to talk in this first part about the women's race. The result really went to form. Sana Kant won for the second year in a row, um, but it wasn't really a straightforward race. There was a lot of nip and tuck, very close between her and Katie Compton for a while. At one point, Compton was in the lead, the American rider. Then they were neck and neck and then Kant's strength in the final part told. Meanwhile, just behind there was the battle for the bronze medal between Lucinda Brand of the Netherlands uh, and she got the edge ahead of Christine Majerus of Luxembourg. So before we talk about the race, let's hear from the three medalists in ascending order from bronze medal Lucinda Brand, then Katie Compton of the USA and then the champion who defended her crown successfully, Sana Kant. In the last lap, uh, last lap I, I came back and I thought just went over and standing on the pedals and, and maybe she will crack then and then I can uh, continue in my own rhythm again. But, uh, and, and, and luckily it worked out like that because I didn't have that much left anymore. So, yeah. What did you make of the course? There was a lot of running, wasn't there? Yeah, it was really a lot of running and anticipating from when you jump on the bike and off the bike. And um, yeah, it was a really, really tough co- circumstances. Katie, that was a heck of a battle. When you were in front, did you think there was a chance to crack Sana? Oh, there's always a chance. But I know Sana, I know how, how hard she races. I know how, how bad she wants to win. And she's really strong at the end of races. So um, there's always a chance when we're going back and forth that way. But she was faster at the end. She was stronger. I just really struggled a bit on the running. And then um, I just got tired. So I did the best I could. And, you know, second is what I could do today. There was more running than I wanted. I would have liked to have a little bit more riding because I'm better at that. But, uh, you know, it's a cross race. Sometimes there's running, sometimes there's riding, sand, mud, dry. It, you got to do it all. Um, and I'm fairly consistent at a lot of courses, just apparently not uh, the best at some of them. <laughs> Lastly, Sana seemed to change her bike quite a lot where you were riding through the pit sections. Maybe you were changing your bike in other places. Was it roughly even, do you think, on the bike swap? Yeah, I lost a little bit of time coming into the pit um, at one time when she didn't. 
uh, she closed up the gap there. So that was kind of frustrating. But uh, I think we were changing pretty consistently. I was changing almost every half lap, at least every lap. It was just um, the bikes were getting heavy and muddy and rocks were getting in the shifting. So um, I was uh, losing a little bit gearing. But it's so muddy and the conditions are so tough. The fact that electronic shifting works in these conditions is pretty amazing. So... Congratulations. How does this year's race compare with last year? Uh, I think it's uh, difficult to compare. So uh, last year it was a battle with uh, Mariana Vos, but now it was uh, with uh, Katie Comston. Uh, she also deserved it to win. She uh, also ride from September until uh, the end of the season. And she's really, really strong. Um, but I'm happy uh, I can keep uh, this uh, nice jersey. Was it a relief when you got the gap? Did you know you had the jersey and the medal in the bag? No, no, it, uh, it was really fighting uh, until the end. So uh, if you uh, make a mistake, uh, uh, the gap is uh, faster, it's, it's, it's small. So uh, I was happy uh, I could, uh, when I uh, saw the finish line. So Renat Sanakant there, she really turned on the, the gas in the last second half of the last lap really and that was where she pulled away. Do you think there was a particular point where she had the race in the bag? Yeah, I, I do actually. What struck me though uh, in her first reaction after the race was that she said that she thought it was over, that she would lose it um, entering that final lap and then the turning point really was the um, penultimate bike change in the, in the pit zone. Katie entered with a couple of seconds advantage and she, she looked strong but then somehow she had a bad bike change and she started running really early on that section and Sana made a terrific uh, comeback and then by the end of that zone she was leading which was astonishing and that was a turning point I spoke about it with Compton afterwards she admitted that was a very important point Kant said the same about at that moment so it was really a turning pound point in the race in the final lap but she was the strongest rider overall whether running or riding Balin yeah definitely she was just going really strong and to be honest with you I thought after the first two laps they, or the first lap but it, it, was, it was done it was she was just going to ride away and we are going to have a boring race and then that's when Casey Compton started to come back and that was that was just quite impressive and quite a sight, sight to see uh, we, we looked at it and the last time Compton was was in the front of a, a world championship race was, was back in Louisville in 2013 so it's quite 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 a while and she's been trying to to win the world championship race and I think she came the closest for a, for a long time now. and possibly the closest that she will come um, and of course Louisville was home soil I know the America's a huge country but you know that that was a course I, I presume that suited her but she came good came really strong she's had success in the World Cups this season were you surprised that she coped so well with the muddy conditions because she did say in our interview with her you know she would have preferred a little less running yeah and I think it was a bit surprised that she did so well in Nome two weeks ago Ago because she just came back from the nationals and that always kind of wreaks havoc on that on that form of the American riders form uh, so when she won and Casey Keogh was second that was just like wow so maybe maybe Compton might do some might do really well at the world championships so I was expecting her to, to, to do well and, and she won this race before so she knows in this, this course in, in and out. It's an amazing result she's put in once again. I mean, like uh, Mark Legg, her uh, man always says, jet lag is a myth and she's playing with time zones like nobody else and uh, it's really astonishing to see her performing at today's course and I think everybody in the cyclocross world would have liked to see a win from Katie Compton and, and there was this particular moment in the pit zone that was really breathtaking um, I was about to I was looking for Mark Leck, her man and he was standing there in his, um, in his pit with his eyes closed just for half a minute in the midst of the race. I think that sums it up. I mean, he really was like, I don't know what he was doing, meditating or anything, but he wanted her so badly to win because he's sacrificing himself, his life for her, which is, to me, very touching. So, Sana Kant, though, was the strongest rider. In terms of how the course played out, um, people who might have been watching for the first time or, or haven't watched a, a lot of cyclocross, maybe they would think, this is crazy. Surely this is, like, can't they postpone this and play play the match on a, on a day when the pitch is uh, in better condition? Not many sports uh, put their competitors into a, an environment where it's just 
I mean, it was survival of the fittest, really, wasn't it? Is there in the cyclocross world any point where people go, oh, no, this is too much, this is now a farce? Or would, would you say, look, if they have to run 70% and cycle 30% of the circuit, is that still a valid cyclocross race? It is mentioned in the rules, but I don't think we got near that point today. And um, cyclocross rules is about um, making little things bigger as well. I mean, it was an issue, and everybody, of course, is then talking about it. And is there too much running? Is there too much mud? I was speaking with, with um, one of the UCI guys, and he said, look, if there's no mud, everybody's complaining the race course is too fast. And now that we have mud, everybody says there's too much mud. So I think we had a terrific world today on, in great conditions, which were really um, propaganda for cyclocross in, in its own. On the subject of the course, let's hear a little bit from Helen Wyman, uh, who finished 13th riding for Great Britain. Uh, Britain's best finisher was actually Nikki Bramier, who finished in 11th. But Helen Wyman, she certainly had no beef with the course, and she said it suited her down to the ground. Um, it's one of my favourites because there's no ice and no snow, and there's a lot of mud, and uh, there's a lot of running, and it's tough, and a lot of tough power what are you riding and so yeah it's a really hard course everyone knows it's a really hard course and I think it's, it's fantastic I think it's very fair the strongest rider wins and that's what you want of your world champion all the running was short so you're running up a run hill you're running up steep banks you're not actually running running and a lot of like I said a lot of the places I was riding where others were running and so the course actually flows really really well and like half of the course is actually downhill riding so the, all the way from the start you go down all those banks and stuff and then until, until you get to the first rut where you have to run and that's probably like eight nine hundred meters so you're flowing a lot you're doing it might seem it from the outside but it actually flows really well the course Okay, so when we look at the rest of the results, a couple of things, you know, from my kind of layman's eye, really, the big names that didn't perform today, maybe not such a surprise, Mariana Voss. She was down in 18th position. It, you know, she's had a difficult season, hasn't she? It's not been a, her best year. Was that about par for her, or do you think if the course had been firmer and faster, she would have done better, perhaps, Balin? I don't think so. She just hasn't shown a good form this year. Last year, when... Thing leading up to the World Championships, she was just winning almost everything. So, the fact that she and and Sana Khan was kind of dueling in the last couple of laps, that was, I wouldn't say predictable, but but that wasn't a surprise. I think this year, if she was up on the front, that would have been a would have been a surprise. So, I think the course didn't really matter. She's just not not in the form to 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 be be at the top and the front near the front at the moment. Yeah, I saw her at the finish in the mix zone. She's pretty disappointed looking because she's just not used to that kind of result. Even on even on one leg, we're used to seeing Mariana Voss finish in sort of contention for the podium, aren't we? Yeah, for a seven times world champion, it was disappointing. But at the other hand, I spoke with her for sports uh, shortly before the race. And then she, you could see that she didn't believe for one second she could manage uh, an eighth world title today. So uh, basically, she knew she was not able to win in front of her home crowd. And I think... Um, if you look at her past, it's difficult for her to, to compete in those conditions. If you're used to come out and win like she did in the past, and then you now you have to battle for her uh, in a further distance, then that's really, it's difficult also mentally, I think. The Dutch did get a good result, though. Lucinda Brand in third place. And, and this is, I guess, part of her. She's going straight off to tr a road training camp from here. So this is kind of the start of her road season almost, particularly for her keeping an eye on the, the, the spring classics, uh, Newsblad and so on, um, going towards, uh, um, you know, Flesh Wallone and, and Liege, Baston Liege. Not ideal uh, conditions today, perhaps, but certainly a, a real sort of uh, anaerobic workout, definitely, or is it aerobic workout? We need a sports scientist on here for that. You know, that was a, a good result for the Dutch. So they, they did something on home soil, gave the, gave the crowd uh, something to cheer. But I did notice that um, the Dutch went very quiet when, Kant got herself into the lead and all the Belgians started cheering. I don't know whether you guys saw many of the people out on the course, but quite a lot of the Belgian fans had already started celebrating long before Kant got into the lead and uh, some of them were slipping and sliding over on the, on the mud as they came out. I think perhaps one or two less beers would have, would have been advisable for them. What about Pauline ferrand Prevot as well, 24th? I mean, Renard, you were talking her up yesterday and uh, that really is a surprise. 
Well, I'm glad I was wrong, of course, <laughs> because uh, with Kant, uh, Belgium is really happy. But at the other side, I think uh, Pauline, uh, obviously, she was still hampered by, by the uh, injury from last week. I mean, she uh, didn't want to say before the race that, that it was uh, admitting her being 100%, but I think that is the only explanation because uh, this is really, for her, it's not a result um, on her level. How about you, Balin? Anything else from the results or anything else you saw out there on the course today that caught your eye? I think a lot of people were kind of supporting Christine Majerus, who last year it was there, it was her kind of home world championships in Luxembourg, and so she finished in seventh place. And so I was, I was just wondering as I was watching the race that she finished today fourth, but if she was kind of getting the support of a home crowd, would that kind of prepare her to a podium place? Um, I guess we'll, we'll never know, but that, that is definitely a good, good result. And I'm, I'm really surprised to see uh, Elisabeth Brando in the fifth place, which is, um, I don't remember her seeing her that high up if for a very, very long time. The interesting thing is that lots of people are saying that this is a mountain biker's course, like it's, it's really good for mountain biking. And yet it seems that the, um, the best mountain biker is probably Eva Lechner in seventh place. So maybe it wasn't, maybe it was too muddy or there was too much running. Like quite often you could see that um, certain parts, like the off camber uh, part of the course, it was so steep that it was faster if you jumped off the bike and just ran. So maybe that was the reason that the mountain bikers didn't really have a, um, an advantage on this course today. Mountain biking is, is a summer sport and I think uh, once the mud gets in it's a different ball game and that was proof today, this, today's race, uh, it was clear that the mountain bikers lost their advantage on the climbing sections because it was all, it was mud all over the place, so it was completely different. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. A.V. Richards will uh, start her final lap within less than 30 seconds from now. En vanuit onze commentaarpositie bedaren de verte naar beneden rijden op de grote brug. A.V. Richards, de koploopster, met een interessant duel. Ik zei het u al om de nummers 2, 3 en 4. Daarbij rijden ook uh, de Nederlandse Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, de Oostenrijkse Nadja Heidel. En hou je het harden, die lijkt wat de trein te moeten prijsgeven, Nico. One lap to go in the battle for the rainbow jersey, the battle for gold, silver and brown. See, she is the lady in fourth position, getting the vocal support from the crowd. Final lap of the race, A.V. Richards, problems I think, with the change. Thank you to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycle Cross podcast and the Cycling Podcast all year. Uh, if you want to get 25% off all Science in Sport products, you can go to the website scienceinsport.com and then when you check out, having filled up your basket with goodies, enter the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 and you'll get 25% off the bill. Uh, you just heard there a little bit of noise from out on the course, the, the announcer, um, basically heralding Evie Richards as she went through the finish line for the penultimate time with one lap to go. The under-23 women's title was well in the bag. Um, a very impressive performance by Richards. Uh, she's still only 20. Um, this is the third year of the under-23 women's race at the Cyclocross World Championships, and her record is gold, bronze, gold now. Um, pretty much dominant. And you wonder, when will she make the step up to uh, competing at... Um, elite level. We'll hear a little bit now from Evie Richards. She was obviously delighted to win the rainbow jersey and gold medal. That was a very convincing win, but it didn't at any stage look easy, and you went pretty deep, I think. Yeah, no, it was a really, really hard race. Um, probably one of the hardest races I've had in a long time, so I just had a bit of a crash early on, just because it was just so overwhelming, and I've been bigging this up in my head for so long, and when it happens, it all happens really quick, so I dug from the start, and then I had a mechanical and I just had to really focus and just keep pushing on and I think because there's loads of running it just drains you so much this sort of race in terms of coming into the race with 
a lot of expectation from yourself, I guess. Was it different to a couple of years ago when, you know, no one knew what to expect, I suppose? Yeah, definitely. I didn't get to bed till half four this morning. I've just been, like, worrying and, like, been going through this moment for so long. So, yeah, it's completely different, but I've put the pressure on myself and that's how it should be. I'm a professional cyclist now and that's my job. So, yeah, the pressure should be on me, really. In a funny way, did the early fall kind of help you focus the mind just warn you that anything could happen on the course yeah i think i just like really uh, shook myself it's like come on with evie get your get yourself together you need to concentrate now and uh, yeah i dug deep and then just like got to the start where i wanted to be in out of any crashes and everything and yeah then i was in my zone as you could say were you aware that it was Harriet who was just behind you for quite a long time in the race? Hattie's an amazing ride and I was so pleased when I heard she was behind me and just like gutted she just didn't just missed out on the medal but she's a first year and it's absolutely amazing like how well she's riding and she's from Malvern as well so that she goes to the turbo sessions I, I go to so I think it's a big thanks to Liam Colleen and Tracy Mosley for helping us out so much at home and Simon my coach has been amazing as well supporting us like through all this. Evie Richard also said that her next big goal is the mountain bike race at the Commonwealth Games a little bit later. Um, so today was not she was not really pushed, and, and I did ask her whether the, the early fall was just that little um, event that focused the mind and, and made sure that she made no mistakes. I mean, she kept the pressure on all the way through, and right as, after she finished across the line, collapsed to the ground and had to be carried into the tent, um, you know, to, to uh, get washed down and, and changed. So it was a, although she had a good margin and it was a comprehensive win, um, she certainly didn't let up on herself one moment. Well, after the finish line, she looked unconscious to me, really knocked out like a boxer. Um, she was carried out like, like it was a boxing ring, and maybe that was the right description of the, today's race. It was a boxing ring with um, lots of uppercuts and, and stuff like that. I mean, I mean the, the crash she made in the beginning of the race, really that was one of the, the trickiest points in the race course because there was um, these uh, tree uh, base, I don't know the exact word. Tree roots. Tree roots, yeah, it's so simple. The tree routes were actually being liberated because it wasn't um, muddier enough anymore and that was very very traitorous and that's why so many people crashed there they tried to they tried to avoid the tree routes but that was really impossible and to me the um, the youth the women's youth race was really an epic race though it was won by quite a margin by ev richards to be fair, and I don't know what tree roots are in Flemish, so uh, you know I'll let you off that one. Um, it was an impressive performance. I spoke to Helen Wyman a little bit about Evie Richards, just to get an older rider's perspective on just how good she is and how good she can be. Oh, she'd easily be in the top ten, if not the top five. Um, she won a World Cup. She won Narman World Cup. I don't know. You never, you never know. You never know until she's able to ride it. And everybody's on their peak for this event. And Narman she beat everybody that was there she had a really good day and other people had some problems like Lechner punctured I think three times or something but even so she won so she's one of the strongest riders out there and last weekend she was third in Hoogerheide on a really crazy fast course so two very different courses I think today she seemed a bit stressed beforehand I've never seen her like that before maybe the expectations are really high but she actually took it on and she took the race on and even when she had a problem she still she still stayed calm and won Helen Wyman there making the point that if Evie Richards had ridden the senior race, she would have been comfortably in the top 10. Is that how you see it, Balint? Definitely. I mean, she's in a terrific form. She won in Namu at the elite race. Uh, she came third last weekend in Hogenheide. So she's in a really good form. And we might have to eat our words because she's a mountain biker. So she was probably the only mountain biker today um, who kind of excelled in, in today's condition. So I think... The only threat to Eva Richards is that she's going to be, she's going to kind of leave cross and she's going to focus on, on mountain biking solely in the coming years. But as if, if she stays in cross, anything is possible for her. Well, it's going to be one of those questions for next season, isn't it? Whether or not she sticks another year at under 23 level. It doesn't seem to be an awful lot of point doing that. Keep winning the same race a, th a third time. It wouldn't mean as much as, as even getting, say, a bronze or, or a top 10 in a, in a senior world championships, I guess. An impressive performance, though. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things from our point of view as you know, a British journalist as I am, or Irish technically, but uh, have, a, have a keen eye on the, on the British riders. But it's a funny thing. You see... So you see that talent and you want to kind of put it into context and, you know, where could that talent take her? Obviously, mountain biking is, uh, you know, it's another 
another string to her bow, but whether she could translate that into um, a road career as well. I mean, it's very hard to say, but are, th are there any signs there, do you think, Renat? Well, that's a very difficult question, Lionel. I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm able to answer that one because uh, I, I guess I don't know enough about her, but she's really very impressive. And if you think about her first world title two years ago, that was her very first cyclocross, international cyclocross ever. So I think she's quite a limitless rider and, and she reminds me a lot of, um, of the... Uh, the male bloke you also have, um, Tom Pitcock. So she's the uh, the female version of Tom Pitcock, both with uh, limitless potential, and I'm curious to see where it's going to end. Or maybe Tom Pitcock is a male version of Evie Richards. I mean, it works both ways around. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits, and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much to Rafa, our headline sponsor here on the Cyclocross podcast, a, a little a little tree root of the cycling podcast that we've established here for the World Championships here. And if it goes well and if you like the show, um, we would like to be able to make it a regular fixture of the next cyclocross season, which starts in the autumn. Um, just before the Rafa jingle there, uh, Renard made the, the point about uh, the British blokes who are doing quite well at cyclocross. Last year, of course, they had the 1-2-3 in the junior men's race. Tom Pidcock won um, and Dan Tullett was second. Tom Pickcock and Dan Tullett will be in the under-23 race tomorrow. And, well, Ben Tullett, Dan's younger brother, went one better. Um, it was a really impressive performance. He tussled with the World Cup winner, Thomas Kopecki of uh, the Czech Republic, for quite a lot of the middle section of the race and then just pulled away at the end. Um, let's hear a little bit from Ben, understandably delighted to win the rainbow jersey. First of all, you were in the lead for a little bit and then Kopecki came back. Was there a part of the course on the final lap that you thought, that's where I need to push on? Um, not really. I, I was going pretty deep when I got away We're on the second lap, going in the second lap. And I saw that he was coming back a bit, so I sat up, waited for him to come back, and then I, I gritted my teeth again and I really just went for it. I just thought, rainbow stripes, there's nothing better than that. He's got to go for it. <laughs> was there a moment that you knew you'd cracked him? I cracked him going through the last, sorry, this, um, the pits with half a lap to go. I knew that, yeah, I had to dig deep there and, yeah, my legs were really hurting. I just knew I just had to keep them going. How hard was it with all the transitions as well, on and off the bike, swapping bikes as well, yeah. legs feeling like jelly? It was a proper cross race today, just everything, deep ruts, mud, slippery sections, power sections, just all of it. Just Who have you got supporting you here today? the whole of British cycling so I can't thank them enough the work is just incredible and what about going one better than your brother did last year yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> a bit of brotherly love yeah after I'd spoken to Ben Tullett in the mix zone, I bumped into Dean Downing just outside. He was wearing one of those bobble hats that everybody seems to have here at the Cyclocross World. His was in British national colours, red, white and blue, and I had said he now needs to swap it for a, a rainbow version because Dean Downing has been coaching Ben Tullett. He's known the Tullett brothers uh, around 10 years. Uh, Dean Downing, of course, a uh, road rider, national crit champion. Uh, as I'm saying all this, Renard's just put on his woolly hat. Uh, he did say he was equipped for all weathers, and that's uh, is that a cyclocross woolly hat. I think that might be advertising. We're not going to be mentioning that brand on this podcast. Um, well, anyway, let's hear a little bit from Dean Downing, uh, who knows Ben Tullett well. Well, Dean, the rainbow jersey looks good on him, eh? Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. There he is. Yeah, what a day. What a day. I've come over here with Alistair, Ben's dad, uh, and most people know I've known, known the Tullet family for a long time. My old personal friends, like 10 years probably. Yeah, so I've seen the boys grow up, Ben and Dan both. So last year was special seeing Dan, seeing Dan take take silver. Uh, but today has been bonkers. It really has. It's unbelievable. Just proof of his commitment. I think uh, he's, he's committed to everything with cycling. Um, he certainly committed on the last lap, didn't he? 
Yeah, yeah, we were watching on different parts of the circuit and big screen and um, with a just just under a lap to go, or so over a lap to go, he came alongside uh, Kopecky and, and, I, and Alistair said, oh, what's he doing? I said, I think he's sizing him up, see how he's doing. Uh, and I spent about it afterwards and he said, oh, kind of, I just wanted to know how, how hard he'd been going and tried to work out. And, and Ben said he was struggling himself with a lap to go and he thought he was going to blow. But then I think it was over a, just... After the finish, Kopecky put a massive effort in and, and gapped Ben a bit, but then he must have blow after that and then went over the top. I, I'm guessing that's what happened and, uh, yeah, he's world champion. <laughs> so, Renard, what do the Belgians make of all these British blokes coming along and, and, and doing well at, at your discipline, really, isn't it? Uh, it's a, it's a very much a, a Belgian thing. It hasn't quite translated yet into success at the senior level for the men, but these this group of youngsters I mean have they caught the eye of the Belgians covering the sport yeah of course um, the general feeling about it is that British cycling is working with all those talents like they do on, on track basically so so if they prepare them to be peak level on the one day that's really important at Worlds and uh obviously very successful and obviously the reservoir of talents is also quite big in, in uh, Great Britain and I do sincerely hope that the, the organizational side of the story will follow and that we have World Cups soon uh, across the channel because I think that's an important step to make in uh, soccer cross development and uh, if the organizations follow then you will have more talents even coming to the races and then it will be um, a circle of, of, uh, of success I mean where will this story end? And I just hope British cycling doesn't think about cyclocross as a non-Olympic discipline. It's just a great discipline and you can develop riders for huge performances and, and great performances, great results. And it, I, I think it helps British cycling in, in, in its total uh, image as well. It's like you read my mind there, Renard, because I wanted to make a point about the, the World Cup. There was a World Cup in Milton Keynes a couple of years ago, and in terms of the crowd, that turned out a very successful weekend. So it does show that there's a crowd and an audience for cyclocross in the UK, uh, whether it be a World Cup or a World Championships. Um, the big thing that kind of holds it back from a British cycling point of view is the, because it's not an Olympic sport and because of the way cycling is funded in the UK, you know, all along the lines of where Olympic medals can be won, and um, that's always going to have an impact but I think British cycling certainly have stepped up because it's a pathway into the sport if you can get kids doing cyclocross you can assess talent you can move them on you can you know see whether they would work in other areas other disciplines in cyclings but that thorny question of cyclocross and the Olympics I mean one of the questions that always comes up is whether it should be considered an Olympic sport for the Winter Olympics we've got the Winter Olympics coming up in uh, where is it now it's in South Korea that's coming up very soon I mean would is this something we could even have on the radar? I mean, is it, is it or is it a daft question, Balint? Should cyclocross be in the Winter Olympics? It's a, it's a definite yes. I think it, it would be a no-brainer. It would be a new discipline that's kind of different from all the other disciplines. It would be an exciting. It doesn't need an awful lot of infrastructure, unlike quite a few other sports. It wouldn't take up, like, the problem with, like, in cycling, that in the Summer Olympics, that they have a, a certain number of disciplines. So if something comes in, there's something has to go out. So... But in you know the Winter Olympics, the, we, the UCI wouldn't have this problem. I think the big problem is that the, the the IOC wants ice or snow by definition in the sport, and we quite quite often get that. But so, you know it, you can't can't guarantee it. So and I think in terms of how people view cyclocross, because it's still it's just a, an afterthought in the grand scheme of things um, in most of the countries outside of outside of Belgium, and. If it was an actual Olympic sport, that would just kind of up the stakes probably all over the world because that would just, just open up you know, all sorts of new possibilities. Let there be no doubt about it. Cyclocross has an Olympic status in Belgium. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the rules have to change for starters. I mean, the ice and snow thing you just mentioned, Balint, I think it's in the rules of the uh, Winter Olympics, so uh, they have to change the rules first. And also it has been discussed before by people within UCI, with IOC, uh, but apparently um, the, the times are not ready for it yet. So um, it would change the whole sport of cyclocross if it would become Olympic, I'm quite sure, because then British cycling would immediately fund it with uh, that brilliant uh, lottery system they've put up in, uh, in the UK. So. 
let's just cross our fingers and hope it happens one day. But um, I'm not sure it's, it's going to happen that soon because change program at Olympics, it's so difficult. It's a slow process. If you look at uh, the reintroduction of um, the medicine has got off the program in Beijing after Beijing 2008. And it only will get back to it in, in Tokyo 2020. So that's 12 years. That's two Olympiads without uh, medicine, which was a real disgrace. Well, I mean, I mean that's the Belgian point of view, isn't it? A Madison racing is a, is a, the next big staple of uh, of Belgian cycling, isn't it? We talk snow and ice. Uh, the forecast is for temperatures to dip tonight, not quite to snow and ice status, but with how wet the course is, it could become stiffer. It could the mud could get thicker. It could become even more challenging to to the bits of it just about rideable now might become not rideable or it's not going to firm up enough I don't think but from what we've seen today what are we expecting tomorrow Renart and do we change our assessment of who the the big favourites are for the men's race tomorrow afternoon I expect more punctures than today because of the conditions um, if it stays dry like this then then the, more um, uh, rubbish is it maybe not a good word but the, the are you trying to say that the, the, the sludge and the ruts that have been yeah. made will firm up? Also, all the stones have been churned up in the mud, so you think there's a higher risk of punctures maybe tomorrow? I'm quite sure. I've heard that from a couple of team leaders, and usually those guys know uh, even way better than I do stuff. So, uh, I'm, And then we're back to this Luxembourg game. Last year we saw, of course, the, the big drama in Luxembourg unfolding with the... Uh, uh, four times flat tiring Mathieu van der Poel you just don't hope that it happens again but it was part of the game and it cost them the world title eventually so um, also the mental game will step in then uh, quite fast because if um, if it's very muddy then Van Aert already lives, lives up to the occasion he knows mud that's my thing that's my, my occasion that's my chance and then the mental game plays a role but Van der Poel is so self-assured so a lot will have to happen to disrupt him I think mentally tomorrow What do you think Balin based on what we've seen today how do you think it will play out tomorrow? We just saw before the uh, the juniors men's race uh, that there's going to be a new tyre for uh, for Wout van Aert. and if you remember last year at the World Championships it was well it was said it was all about the tyres because uh, Wout was, uh, was riding this old Michelin green tyre and everybody was just like where did this tyre come from? And it was like Niels Albert's kind of old stash and he just... So that, that, that's why he was supposed to not have as many punctures as, as, as the others. Are you saying there's some kind of tyre doping going on in the world of cyclocross? Is, is it kind of like, uh, you know, the, the, the old Belgian guys are putting vinegar on them and they're hanging them up from... Uh, like hanging them up like Parma, Parma ham and that kind of thing to mature? <laughs> I went to see Richard Newhouse, who's the um, Ducast um, tyre factory's owner, and he's a proper geek in a, in a good sense he just knows so much about tires and so he was showing us today the, the, the track for tomorrow's race and all the all the tricks that went into creating this set of tires and sometimes what he does is he prepares a certain set of tires just for one race it costs like 400 euros so not everybody can afford it but that tire was is going to be the best tie that you can you can get. So there is definitely a, an arms race going on here, and and it's it's probably a dark art. <laughs> Talking about food again, eh? he's he's treating the tires like uh, pata negra eh? for sure. <laughs> I have to say, I'm seeing a new business here, an opportunity. Maybe I could set myself up as some kind of tyre guru, come up with a medicine or a, a mixture. I'm thinking, I don't know, uh, some kind of cheese and Vaseline. Uh, rub that on your tyres before a big cyclocross race. I mean, a lot of these kind of things are... I mean, obviously, it's not a matter of the mind to not puncture, but you said there, Renard, about the... You know, Van der Poel's four punctures last year, at some point you think, well, this is not my day. I mean, so the mental side of it, in something like this, when a slip or a puncture or a mechanical problem or just your bike getting clogged up with mud could be the difference between gold and silver, it's all to play for, isn't it? Yeah, you just hope it doesn't happen again for Mathieu because two years ago it was the same. The, the, it was the bike... Um uh, the bikes, their bikes were twisted uh, with each other, and then um, Wout came out as the winner, the mental winner of that. And, and Mathieu was in the background, uh, being miser miserable. And uh, I do think that this year his mental 
condition has been stronger than, than uh, in the, uh, the previous couple of seasons because everything was running smoothly for Mathieu uh, apart from a couple of uh, unmentionable sicknesses but for the rest he's had a, a dream season he's still aiming at a record uh, number of victories uh, I mean uh, if he loses tomorrow then everybody will say that he's the loser of the season which is really not it doesn't reflect reality because he will, for me, stay the man of the season. Well, this is what we want, isn't it? We want we want to see a finely balanced battle between two riders. We've got Van der Poel, who has dominated in the World Cups. We've got Van Aert, who's won the last two rainbow jerseys. It couldn't be more finely balanced. I'm going to be very unfair. I'm going to put you on the spot. Balint, tomorrow, who wins? Van der Poel, Van Aert or someone else? I'm going to say Lars van den Haar. Oh, oh, oh uh, <laughs> Renard. Well, if we... If I have to pick not Van Aert or not Van der Poel, then I'll, I'll go for the Mudman, and that's the former European champion, Ton Arts. He might pull off the surprise of the day, because Mud, that's, he's sleeping in mud. He's sleeping in mud. Well, I saw the two Nets uh, fan club come in today, all in their jackets and hats. Um, this joke might not work on you two, but I've already called them the Toon Army, which is a nickname for Newcastle United football fans. Um, so we'll look out for the Toon Army tomorrow. We'll look out for the Van Der Poel fans. We'll look out for the Van Aert fans. I'm going to sit on the fence and say, because I, if I say I don't know who's going to win, I can't be wrong in tomorrow's show, can I? So until then, Renat, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome, Lion. And thank you, Balin. Thank you. You've been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Not only do you get access to exclusive feature-length documentary-style episodes, you help us provide free daily coverage of all three Grand Tours. This episode was edited and produced by Will Jones. 